everyone. Welcome to The Transgender Show. I'm your host, Emily. Tonight, I'm very excited about my guest. It's Gabrielle Claiborne. She's among the most prolific trans advocates we've had on the show. Ms. Claiborne is co-founder uh, and CEO of Transformation Journeys Worldwide, an inclusion training and consulting firm with a transgender focus. She helps cutting edge organizations create inclusive, collaborative environments to attract and retain the best talent. Some of her clients include Home Depot, Bank of America, Royal Bank of Canada, Comcast, Mercedes-Benz, UPS, Kaiser Permanente, Cox Media, and so many more. She has been an out and active trans woman since 2010. She served on the executive board for Atlanta Pride for the past five years and currently serves as a chair, a co-chair of the membership committee for the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce's TGNC Task Force. She's also a TEDx speaker and an author. And as I said, I'm gonna go ahead and let her talk more about herself because her list is too long for me to list here. Everybody, welcome to the show, Gabrielle Claiborne. Thank you, Thank you Emily. I'm so excited to be with you all today. Well, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And like I said, it's wonderful to have somebody with your pedigree here, with all the activism and things that you've done. I know you have a different, uh, the different spin on the term activism, but we'll go with it for now and you can correct me in a minute. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So Gabrielle, let's start with, let's start at the beginning. How do you identify? So I identify Emily as a transgender woman, and my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, just, you know, just so that people understand this, I identify with uh, the binary uh, identification of female, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, I know some folks, some trans women are comfortable saying they are trans female. Some say that they're comfortable being just a female. I'm comfortable in in either of those uh, labels, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I noticed that that's pretty common for a lot of trans women that eventually as they go through their transition, they start to identify themselves as, as want to identify themselves as women and kind of drop the trans from that title. Is that how you have moved in right. your transition? This is what I, this is how I can answer that question. Um, when someone gets to know me and meets me, uh, while this aspect of my identity being a transgender woman is is apparent, right? I mean, I'm six foot two and I love wearing four inch heels. So when I'm walking in at six, six, people know, okay, that's a tall woman and then they look a little closer and they say, okay, this is a little different than what I'm used to. Mm -hmm. But for me, uh, what I've come to know about myself is being trans is just a very small aspect of who I am as an individual, right? I'm so much more than that. I'm a mentor, I'm a business owner, uh, I'm an advocate, I'm, I'm even a parent, right? And now a grandparent. So being trans is just uh, over the years, I've realized that I'm so much more than just being trans and, tra and being trans is just one aspect of my totality as a human being. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yeah, you have a you have a lot of accolades and different hats that you that you wear, definitely. <laughs> I show up in many different forms. Yeah, right? as we all do. Yeah, it's not just one thing. Yeah, it's it's exactly. a, a broad spectrum of what we're defined as or what we use to define ourselves. Absolutely. Yes. yes. Well, I'd like to start with a very fun question. How did you choose your name? It's funny, it's funny that this is one of the questions that you ask, Emily, because in my in my book that I just published last September, Embrace Your Truth, The Journey of Authenticity, the introduction is about this name change journey that I was on. Uh, and, you know, at the very beginning of my transition, I I wasn't out to my family. I wasn't out to my parent, my mom and dad, nor my sister, nor was I out to my immediate family, my wife and my kids. So consequently, changing my name had to be navigated carefully uh, on my end because I did not want to be disrespectful 
or expose my family uh, to uh, some some critis- potential criticism because of my transition, because they just weren't at the place where they could, you know, navigate this or respond to it. So, a lot of you know, a lot of trans folks change their either their masculine name to the feminine version or vice versa. I chose to take a different route. I chose to, to keep my initials, G E C. Mm-hmm. And so I started started my online research of finding the the letter the words for or the names for G that started with a G and started with an E. And because I was raised uh, with a strong spiritual heritage, I immediately went to the Hebrew and found the name Gabrielle uh, that started with a G, okay. and then Elena started started with the an E, and then my my what I call my midwife, who kind of helped <laughs> introduce helped me meet myself for the very first time. She suggested the name Claiborne, and I loved Liz Claiborne. I said, okay, let's go with that. So. That's how I ended up with Gabrielle Elena Claiborne. Wow! So you you changed the whole thing wholesale, top to bottom, every part of your name. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I I do not have any of my pre-transition names, and I just felt like that that's going to be, you know, better for my family as they as they navigate their own journeys around my transition. Wow. Okay. And you said you were married at the time. Uh, how did that go with with your your spouse with, with the the name change? Was that fine for for them as far as the last name? And we'll get into the rest later. No. Nope. Yeah, there was definitely some pushback okay. there because you know it's like my wife was saying uh, when I le- legally changed my name, she's like, "How how dare you <laughs> change your last name? Because you gave me your last name, and now you're not owning your last name." <laughs> And so when I tried to explain to her the reason why I did that, I think that she understood, but because it was still so new for her, and, you know, after a 30-plus year marriage, it's like, so where do I go from here, right? So this this uh, prompted uh, invitations for her to figure out what moving forward might look like for her. So there was pushback, but over time, uh, as we've, talk through and rationalize through a lot of the dynamics that uh, involve, you know, a spouse, a parent, a child coming out to their family. Uh, we become good friends, which I'm very grateful for. When did you first realize you were were different and what were those clues for you? You know, long before you identified as trans, what looking back, what were some of those things that would lead you to realize that you were trans? Yeah, that's a great question, and one that I often get asked. Um, You know, growing up pre-internet days, and I'm not going to disclose my age because I kind of keep that personal, but I was raised in the pre-internet days, and, you know, back then, we didn't have the language to understand, you know, this, this dynamic that was going on inside of us. I remember at the age of eight, Emily, that there was something different, and I didn't understand you know, like I said, I didn't have the language, nor did I understand what that was. For some reason, I wanted to go into my mom's closet and try on her clothes exactly. and dress in those clothes. And uh, every time that I would do this, when my family was out of the house, it was like I felt aligned with, you know, who I was intended to be. But because I was raised in the very conservative Christian family and environment, um, I perceived this as something that was wrong with me, that I was sinning against God, you know, all of those shameful and, and thoughts of guilt, being guilt, guilty about, you know, this this internal uh, nudge of who I really was. Yeah. And so throughout, throughout my, you know, adolescence and teenage years, I suppressed that and I, I went the other way and I tried to you know, I was a good athlete. I was a good student in school. Um, I married a beautiful woman, and I did the things that culture expected of a heterosexual male to do, right? And so, um, it was after a number of different invitations along my journey that I started recognizing that, okay, Gabrielle, it's time to get honest with yourself, mm-hmm. right? And so, after after 
you know, navigating some hardships in our marriage after, you know, uh, some vocational setbacks with my career. Uh, I finally decided to say, okay, I'm going to get serious and and just explore and see what this was all about. And that's when, you know, 10 years ago, I had this uh, cataclysmic experience of meeting myself and seeing myself in the mirror for the very first time authentically internally and externally aligned and when I finally saw myself I said that's me hmm. and so that set me on the course of taking those courageous steps that a lot of us on today's call have to take in order to embrace this aspect of who we are Yeah, so many common themes there. It's just that that kind of crushing sense of shame and guilt and, and lack of understanding of what it is and recoiling, pushing back against that and trying to do the most masculine, the perfect, the perfect straight and narrow and then realizing right. that no. <laughs> yeah, it's just not working. It's just not working. Not, I, you know, and what I've learned is that Looking back, you know, all those steps that I took to suppress who I really was ended up being inauthentic steps, right? Mm -hmm. So over the course of this last 10, 11 years that I have been transitioning, I've had to reconcile all those steps that I took, you know, whether it's with my family, whether it's with my job, whether it's with my spiritual community, whatever that looked like, right? So um, I've learned the importance of being authentic sooner than later. So what was it that made you realize that you were trans and not something else? What was it that solidified that that was the path for you? Like, I, I'll go back to that moment that I first saw myself. Okay. Um, well, let me, let me go back a little further. You know, when I was a kid, you know, we, my mom and dad used to have a babysitter come over and babysit me and my sister. Uh, and, and there was something about my babysitter that I always wondered why, you know, why wasn't I this way? I was so, I so uh, wanted to have breasts and I couldn't figure out why I didn't have breasts, mm -hmm. you know? It was, you know, I know for a lot of folks that doesn't make sense, but I've now realized that, you know, to, to have that outward alignment, external gender expression alignment with who we are, who we know ourselves to be on the inside is, is very important for that alignment to take place. Yeah. So when I started realizing that that there were biological differences in how I felt, then, um, then I saw that as I didn't know how to navigate that. I didn't know what steps to take in response to that, but that was an invitation. And then, you know, uh, when I met myself the first time years later, it was almost like there was a connection with what I was seeing on the outside and how I was feeling on the inside. And that was that was powerful for me. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that mm -hmm. one incident set me on this on the course of coming out to my wife, coming out to my kids, coming out to my parents, you know, two years later, losing my being fired from my job. You know, trying to decide what does that mean for me moving forward. So, all of these invitations, which I now know are ultimately have been milestones in my life that I can look back to, and and see that I've I've since then taken some courageous steps to embrace those aspects of who I am. Actually, has set me up for who I how I show up in the world today, and it's those courageous steps that I've that I've taken along those different, uh, at, at those different milestones, at those different crossroads in, in my life, if you will, that has uh, developed this sense of courage and confidence in me that mm -hmm. I can, even though something may be, I may perceive it as to be scary or risky, I can step in in that direction knowing that, you know, as long as I'm acting out of integrity with who I know myself to be, that I will be supported as I take those courageous steps. I don't know if that makes sense. No, it really does. And I do, I do appreciate that. And I have felt that too, that, you know, once, once you overcome some of those hurdles in your transition and in, in your, 
personal journey of accepting yourself, then it's almost like there's nothing else in the world that they can do to you. You know, you, 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 you get a pretty thick skin yeah. and you get pretty tough once you can get through a lot of that. Yeah, a lot of, you know, a lot of times when someone, because in the training work that we do, a lot of, I share my personal story, an excerpt of my personal story, and a lot of times people come up to me afterwards and they say, Gabrielle, you're so courageous, I could never do what you did. And I respond by saying thank you, but do you know you have the same capacity of courage? You know, it's just that you have to take that first step. And to your point, Emily, you know, the more we take those courageous steps, and I talk about this in my TED talk, the, the more we build our courage muscles, the more we listen to our heart, and we take those courageous steps, we build our courage muscles. And with each courageous step we take, we get a little stronger, a little more authentic, less stuck, more authentic. And I've learned that in my own personal journey. And so, you know, 10, 11 years later now, I'm taking those courageous steps every day of my life now. Now, you mentioned previously that you lost your job sort of in the midst of things. Was that tied to your, directly right. to your transition? Well, you know, my employer at the time did not ne naturally give that as a basis for my, uh, for my termination. But I can tell you that I was well into the process of changing my external gender expression. I was growing my hair out. I was, you know, I was on a, I was on a weight loss plan. So I was losing weight. So mm. I was, I was uh, pursuing more of this gender feminine expression, feminine gender expression, if you will. And so the, the company recognized these visual cues, uh, these visible cues that were happening in my life. And I think that they suspected that something was going on. And because this was a conservative based company, uh, they basically said, you know, we just don't feel like you're a good fit for our company moving forward. And we're just going to have to cut, sever our sever ties and go our separate ways, to, uh, you know, because of this. And so while they didn't give it, give me a, that, use that as a reason, I suspected that they knew something was going on. But again, you know, I look back on that now today as an invitation to, you know, do the advocacy work that I'm now doing on behalf of the communities, which I'm very grateful for. Yeah, let's continue down that path. What did that spark for you losing that job? Was there a moment for you where you wanted to fight against that or did you take that right away as your chance to, to do something else? Absolutely not. Unfortunately, I wish I would have had that a capacity to do that, but I think I went to a place that a lot of us go to. I, I started, you know, feeling sorry for myself, being down on myself, you know, how dare them you know, terminate me. I was a very good employee. I gave them no reason to, you know, to terminate me. But it was during a conversation that I had with a very close friend of mine where he invited me to consider, so Gabrielle, you know, you're taking these courageous steps over these last two years and you're now at a precipice, right? A fork in the road. And you have a choice to make. You can keep going down this, down the road of you know, how you've been showing up in the world, or you could take this as an invitation from the universe, God, whatever you want to call the high, your higher power, and say, what does this mean for me moving forward? So I chose to adapt the latter as the explanation, as an invitation to what does this mean move for me moving forward? And that's what set me on the course of my journey. And what I have since learned, Emily, is that I didn't have a roadmap. You know, I didn't know, you know, once I lost my job, what my next step looked like. But I continued, to, you know, showing up visibly each day, trying to learn from that experience and embrace it as something happening for me instead of something happening to me. And when I had that paradigm shift, that really helped me uh, step away from the, the victimization perspective uh, woe is me mm -hmm. and kind of step into this as an invitation over the first two years of my transition I really built a very strong support system around me and it was that support system 
that kept me moving forward in the direction that I need to move in that authentic direction, mm-hmm. um, encour- mm-hmm. encouraging me, celebrating me, you know, giving me a space to show up and grow into who I've become as a woman. And if it had not been for that support group, and I mean, this is this includes spiritual community, this includes best friends, this includes vocational colleagues, it includes all of those folks, right? Um, that support system actually elevated me up to where I can navigate through those dark periods that we all go through when we just feel like saying, you know, I can't take another step, you know, because it's just too hard. Mm -hmm. And I talk about the importance of that support system in my book in chapter two. Um, It was, it was life changing for me. Yeah, and that's that's a really important part of it. And that was actually kind of the next part we were segueing into is your coming out story. And, you know, usually you start with who did you come out to first and things like that. But it sounds like, you know, your your support structure was what allowed a, a lot of the things in your life. Where did where did your support structure first come to? Who did you who were you able to tur- turn to first? Well, it was who I call my my BBF today, my my bit my best boyfriend. <laughs> um, he was a he was a gay man, and he was actually the bartender at a, a local LGBTQ restaurant. And this oh. became my cheers because <laughs> as I was in in the early years of my transition, I would, you know, I'd walk in and go up belly up to the bar, and Scott was his name, and he would make me. He made me all kind of variations of martinis. I love martinis. I'm a martini girl. <laughs> and so he made me all kind of variations of martinis. And I got to know him uh, during the course of those first two years. And I found myself in a very uh, adversarial and unhealthy living arrangement uh, about two years into my journey. And I called him at three o'clock one morning and I said, you need to come get me out of here because I, I can't take this anymore and he he was there in in less than 30 minutes we packed up the car and I moved in with him and slept on his sofa for three months otherwise I would have been homeless and it was during those three months that we really developed a very close relationship friendship and to date to this day he is one of my best friends Uh, and then from there it was my spiritual community uh, being able to show up in my spiritual community allowed me to bring all the gifts that I had learned uh, over the course of my early years being raised in that conservative faith tradition. Mm-hmm. I was able to show up authentically mm-hmm. in my spirit in a spiritual space, space which I thought was unheard of. And back then it kind of was. Yeah. But this was kind of like very instrumental and very critical for me to as I say, try, I, tr- I was able to try Gabrielle on mm. and kind of grow into, into who I've become. So it was Scott, it was my spiritual community. It even turned out to be my clients. When I, early, early on when I was starting my, my very first job of a cleaning company, my clients actually you know, saw it value to uh, employ me as their cleaning company. And I was able to go into their homes and clean their houses and I was very successful at that and not only was I able to show up in my spiritual community but now I'm being able to show up vocationally uh, as mm-hmm. an entrepreneur and that just you know again, again these were just things that that catapulted me into this place of I can be me and I can survive in this world and how did it go in your family life what it what what happened at home when you started to realize that you were trans, you started to develop this identity and then eventually came out as trans? That's That's been one of the most difficult parts of this journey. I will, I will tell you up front, Emily, yeah. I can tell you going back to that event where I met myself the first time, it was a couple of months later that I called my wife and I said that I'm not coming home. I said I was okay, I just needed some time to find myself. Hmm. By then our three kids were in college. So we told them that I was out of town working and I began to live my life as Gabrielle. And that that was a very difficult phone call for me. I mean, walking away from the people that I love the most was the most challenging 
one of the most challenging steps that I had to take in my journey. And I know a lot of trans folks experience that dynamic in their own in their own journeys, right? And it was yeah. certainly a difficult one for me. And as a result of and I still had not come out to my wife then. It wasn't until two years later that I started coming out to my kids and my wife, even my parents. And I will tell you that it's been a journey. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm yeah. now I'm now divorced after 30 plus year marriage. Again, my wife and I are, are good friends, which I'm very grateful for. But the journey with my kids, all of my kids are 30 and older. You know, this has been a journey for them. And, you know, one day, you know, people will ask me, so how are things with your family? And I said, it depends on when you ask me, because one day I feel like I'm moving forward. The next step, the next day is like a step back, you know? So yeah. as much as this has been, as much as it's been my journey, it's their journey as well. And unfortunately, you know, when I came out to my folks, my folks cut ties with me. So I haven't, I haven't spoken to my folks in 10 years. And wow. again, that's, that's a reality for a lot of folks. And, you know, especially if you're a younger trans individual, I, I mean, I can't even imagine not having the resources and the shelter and the support you know, being a young trans person of family, of parents and siblings. Uh, unfortunately, that's my current dynamic. But I have learned along the way that, like I said, like I, 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 initi- I mentioned just briefly, you know, as much as this has been my journey, it's their journey as well. So I've learned to the important lesson, life lesson of holding space for them mm-hmm. in hopes that they're over time that their hearts will soften and they would want to reconnect with me again. But until then, you know, I continue living my life out loud, you know, doing what I know is mine to do. Yeah, that's so important to live for yourself. You can't really help and live for others until you live for and love yourself. But it's, that's such a struggle. And I, I, I definitely feel a lot of that, that kind of back and forth, give and take with family where it's just like, okay, today I feel like they're accepting and we're all good. And then the next time there's there's something or there's a comment or whatever or um, where where you're like okay now we're I think we're we're a step further back than I thought or maybe even two so I'm sorry that right. that you've had to, to deal with that in your in your immediate family with your kids and with your wife I'm kind of curious can I ask when you decided to take that time to discover Gabrielle. Was there something that you knew about your relationship with, with your wife that you couldn't just come out to her and talk to her first, that you needed to take that time by yourself? Absolutely. I mean, I, uh, my wife came from a similar conservative faith tradition uh, mm-hmm. environment. We raised our kids in a conservative faith environment, and I knew that I could not embrace this aspect of who I was living at home. And that is why I made that difficult phone call, that difficult decision to say, you know, I just cannot do this living home. I have to separate myself, Mm -hmm. at least for a season, to understand, you know, what this is, who I am, and understand what this is for me. And it was after, you know, navigating that for 18 months to two years, I realized that this is really me mm-hmm. and that this is going to happen. This is going to change the form. This could change the form as it has of what our relationship looks like. And I've got to be okay with that. And, yeah. you know, I, you, bring, you bring up a very important point, Emily, and this is, a, this is something that I had to learn later on in life. And that is the importance of loving myself first. You know, what I didn't realize is that I was putting everyone else's, uh, uh, interest before mine and consequently I was just I was not living authentic and as a result I was not showing up the best that I could whether it's as a spouse as a parent as an employee as uh, someone in the spiritual space and you know I didn't know this until one day out with my youngest daughter who I came out to and the first time she saw me we had we went out she said oh my goodness you you seem happier than you've ever been in your whole life and what it, what it what i realized when i heard that i realized that i know why i'm better now and that's yeah. because i'm loving myself first and because i'm loving myself first i'm now able to show up as a better parent for you and that was a aha moment for me yeah 
Yeah, that's like I said that that's really important, and it's wonderful that you you had that with her. You know, Though I find those moments so reassuring when someone tells you that that oh I get it you seem so much happier now and you're like yes yes I do thank you. <laughs> I wanted yes. to point out the a, a similarity and, and something that, that I found kind of important in my transition, which was when I I started to, to really transition after uh, I'd separated from my wife, and then more so after the divorce was final. And there was that same thing where I had to be outside of those constraints to fully dive in and understand myself. And for that first year, when I was really diving into it, I just told myself, okay, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna ask any questions. I, I completely took out all the edges of the box and just said, okay, whatever feels good or whatever I feel like in the morning that I need to do to, to be happy, whatever I want to do, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna honor that and I'm not gonna try and ask why, why this today, any of that, that just, I just to go with it. Again, to give myself that free reign to truly explore every aspect of it and really find out what it was that I was and how I was going to be happy. I love that, Emily. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I call in, you know, living in the moment, you know, mm -hmm. your decision, the, how you show up today is going to determine your tomorrow. And I've, you know, in my own life, I've realized that until we're a we're able to get to that place in our own journeys, whatever those look like for us, do we do we give ourselves permission to show up that way? Mm -hmm. So kudos to you for doing that. Thank you. And just another piece of advice for everyone out there. Did you have a particular role model when you um, started to? try and discover who you were? Was there someone that you, that was visible to you that you look up to? Absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, you know, when I was coming out 10 years ago, there were, there was less visibility for transgender, non-conforming and non-binary folks. I mean, non-binary yeah. folks were very less visible, right? But uh, I really was uh, moved and inspired by Laverne Cox on mm -hmm. Orange is the New Black. And I I really leaned into an interview that I heard from her uh, uh, early on in my transition. She was being interviewed and she was sharing her own personal experience about what it was like for her to show up in the world authentically as a trans woman. And I mean, I mean, let's put this in perspective. Laverne Cox, she's gorgeous, right? Mm -hmm. And she was getting she was getting catcalled and calling all kind of derogative names and terms as she was showing up in the world. And she shared about what she learned as a result of those experiences that she came to terms with that it's okay to be trans. That yeah. while I may be, while she may be different, different is okay. You know, and and I as a trans person and beautiful and it's okay to be a beautiful trans person mm -hmm. and when I heard her say that when I heard her own it it was like I can do that I want to try doing that for my own for my own self and so so I started doing that you know as I started showing up I learned the importance of mirror work you know looking at the mirror every day when I wake up and go to bed saying, Gabrielle, I love you. And it's okay to be a beautiful trans woman. Hmm. And the more I did this, the more, the more I settled into that reality that it's okay to be me. And, you know, Laverne Cox from that perspective has, has been a, a very key component in me, you know, embracing the truth of who I am. Yeah, that's such a big moment and such a difficult one to get to, especially early on, that not only is this me, that's a big enough hurdle to get over, but um, it's actually okay for me to be this, to be trans and to go all in on this. That's okay. Yes, it's... all in. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> what role has therapy played in your transition? Did you, did you, were you able to find a good therapist and have that help? Well, I actually found a life coach, Emily, hmm. and this this life coach I started seeing about seven years ago, and I will tell you, 
the year that I spent with my life coach was life-changing for me because she helped me find my purpose in living. You know, when I started, I, I, I met this life coach at a women's weekend conference that I attended, which, by the way, I was very uncomfortable attending because it was all cisgender women, and I was the only trans woman there. Oh, wow. But wow. I met my life coach. I met my life coach there, and as a result of that that meeting, I reached back out to her and said, I would love to, I would really love to uh, meet with you because I need some help. And so, you know, when anytime when you start uh, uh, seeing someone like a life coach or a therapist, they, they want to ask you, so what do you want to get out of our time together? Yeah. And so I told her, I said, I want to find what is my purpose for living? And so wow. over the course of the next year, I, every time we had an appointment, which was about every month, I would show up with some upset in my life. <laughs> and as a result of showing up in this space with my life coach, she helped me learn to get out of my head and learn to live from my heart. She would ask me questions about, so how did that make you feel, Gabrielle? And I would respond, well, you know, I was, I was, I felt like I was, you know, invisible and she says no Gabrielle those are thoughts I want to tell me I want you to tell me how that made you feel and she, over the course of that next year she helped me learn how to live from my heart and not so much from my head and that was very important for me because as a as being raised as a biological male mm -hmm. I lived here for much wow. for much of my life and finally when I finally learned to live from that heart space I started stepping into more of my authenticity. And over the course of that year, I started volunteering in nonprofit organizations. <clears throat> Excuse me. I started my um, advocacy uh, work. Mm -hmm. uh, and then like a, a year later, uh, we, we kind of had a recap of our time together in the previous year. And I realized that, oh my goodness, I didn't have to find my purpose after all. My purpose found me the more I showed up authentically and learned to live from my heart. So that life coach was was paramount in my life and in and as as you know, in my success as a human being. Yeah, that's that's a wonderful resource to have. That sounds really incredible. Definitely something I could probably use too. <laughs> I strongly encourage it. Yeah. What were some of the key fears that you've had during your transition and how have you overcome them? I know family was a big issue. Were there others as well? Well, I was a very successful entrepreneur, 30 plus year in the construction industry. And I, I, I suspected that I was going to lose my career and mm -hmm. I did lose my career for a couple of years and I had to, I had to repurpose I had to rebrand myself vocationally. Fortunately, I had the privilege of falling back on my entrepreneurial experience, and I did that. But, you know, risk losing your career is huge for yeah. a lot of trans people. And it, it was actually uh, one of the motivations for me actually doing the work that I now do with, you know, trans advocacy work, especially in corporate America. And uh, so losing career, you know, Am I going to be alone for the rest of my life? Is someone going to find me attractive enough to, you know, be attracted to me and spend the, spend their life with me and see me as a valuable human being? You know, I feel like I think that many of us have the fear of being alone, and for me, it was it was one of my fears. You know, yeah. Um, not not being able, you know, losing my losing my family and. While the form of my family has changed, the relationships with my kids and my ex-wife, my now ex-wife, has has become richer as a result of me showing up authentically. And, I, and I'm hoping that through this journey of authenticity that I've been on, that I inspire my kids to find what meaning authentic means for them, you know? Uh, but yeah, it was the risk of family. It was the risk of losing my job, risk of losing, risk of being alone, and and there are many other uh, mm -hmm. fears. You know, many trans people uh, attempt suicide. Forty percent of us attempt suicide, and so 
a lot of us a lot of us feel like we get to the end of the rope and there's there's nowhere else to turn to so consequently we take that that scary step and so a lot of folks uh, cope and handle the struggles and the discrimination that we experience by doing that and I, I strongly encourage uh, folks if you're on this call and you're considering that that is there your life is worth more than that and there are options for you and I would encourage you to seek out those options yeah and you bring up such an important point too that that's I think very vastly overlooked especially to those people that feel overwhelmed feel like they, they can't come out they can never be accepted yes it's possible yeah. that you will lose things but when you live as your authentic self, what you gain and what you gain from those relationships will outweigh it in a lot of ways. So while your male brain that you're thinking up here would have recoiled about the fact, uh, the thought of losing the relationship with your family as it was and, and kind of as that ideal had, set, had been set at, what the relationship you have now is so much more authentic and so much deeper, I'm assuming, in, in, in your wording there, and so much more meaningful because you're your true self. And like I said, that's something, that's an important point that I think we overlook, is what, not what we're losing, but what we will gain. And, you know, you can't see that, that future, but it's an important point. That is, I will tell you, I couldn't have said it better, Emily, because, and here's the thing, you know, as a trans, as an out trans person, a lot of times you don't know that until you take those courageous steps, frightening steps, mm -hmm. right? And until you get down the road and you're able to look back on those milestones that I mentioned earlier, are you able to say, oh my goodness, you know, the perceived risk and the loss of what I was going to perhaps lose or experience pales in comparison, you know, to living a life of regret of an in, in, inauthentic life and so you I couldn't have said it better hmm. that was fabulous have your transition have your transition goals shifted as you've gone through yeah I, I can tell you that a couple of years ago I had an aha moment in my transition uh, for the first eight years of my life it was all about being trans Mm -hmm. And, you know, three years ago, I realized that, oh my goodness, I'm so much more than this. So in my TED talk, I talk about the, the power of living an authentic life, but it's not, you don't, there's not just one dimension of authenticity. There's not just one aspect of authenticity that we have to embrace. You know, as we, as we experience one aspect of authenticity, our heart will call us to embrace yet another aspect of our truth. Mm -hmm. And so three years ago, you know, my life, as I continue showing up authentically and in integrity with who I knew myself to be, my life started unfolding and opening up in new ways. And now, you know, I'm in, in some of the work that I'm doing, I'm actually the, I'm actually mentoring other TGNC MB business owners to be entrepreneurs. And so I'm bringing an aspect of being trans to that conversation, but it's just a small aspect of that. It's more about, you know, how can I help elevated other elevated? How can I help elevate other TGNC and be entrepreneurs? So yeah, our, our journey continues to evolve. We never stop growing. We never stop expanding into more aspects of who we are intended to be, who we're created to be. So. I've learned that, you know, this life is ever unfolding and to be okay with that. And I, I feel like, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Brene Brown fan. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, in one of her books, Rising Strong, she talks about the, the man in the arena. And so while stepping into these new aspects of authenticity can be scary and even you may fail as you're stepping into these new spaces, it's okay. The important thing is to get yourself back up, dust yourself off, and keep moving forward because there's always going to be those folks in the stands who are saying, see, if you wouldn't have done that, that wouldn't have happened. But what I've realized is those people in the stands, the armchair quarterbacks, are really wanting to live 
an authentic life, the way I'm living. And hopefully, you know, my life is being an inspiration for them that, to say that you too can live an authentic life, whatever that looks like for you. So, you know, that, is, that has helped me courageously step into the unfolding nature of my life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was an important lesson that came to me, I think immediately when I finally did come out and I showed up to work uh, presenting for the first time. I hadn't ever considered being a role model or an inspiration in any way to anyone. I That wasn't even a thought, but I was surprised to see that I could be that for people who were not trans, for just everyday Joes that you know you hold yourself back from from living your true life and and exploring what it is you really want to do it's like well if I can do this then you can be whoever you want to be two-part question for you what are the aspects of your life and your presentation and, and your routine that truly make you feel valid as a woman these days and what are the aspects of your life um, if there are any where you feel dysphoric these days Well, I think if we are all honest with ourselves, uh, you know, every time we look in the mirror, we wish that perhaps that there was something different about us. And I tell you, you know, that is reality reality for me. Every time I wake up and, you know, get dressed and look myself in the mirror, uh, I've had to I've had to come to terms with certain aspects of my presentation that they are what they are, and to be okay with that. And it goes back to the conversation we were having about how inspirational uh, Laverne Cox was to me. You know, to be okay with being who you are uh, is a huge part of the journey of uh, showing up in a way that is inspiring other folks to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, making peace with your past is is a huge aspect of this journey of growing into who we who we see ourselves who we know ourselves to be and who we see ourselves becoming um so that was one thing just look, coming to terms with certain things about my expression my presentation that are not going to change i mean my goodness i can't change my height i'm six two <laughs> that's going that's the reality i can't i can't change my broad shoulders and big hands that's the reality of who I am and coming to terms with those things and not letting, you know, folks that who may, who may make comments about that or observations about that, not sway me to go to the, to the, you know, down the rabbit hole, if you will, and mm. say, you know, this is something that I've had to learn to own and I'm okay with it. The, the other thing that I, that has been instrumental in, in being validated and authenticated as a trans woman is the whole dating thing. You know, I've yeah. recently started dating, and I will tell you that dating will invite you to love yourself on a whole new level. Hmm. You know, I'm a, I just so have, I so happen to be attracted to men, and, you know, being on dating sites, you know, these, these men say all kind of things. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've learned real quick when to swipe left or to pay attention hmm. and and you know being learning how to date again at my age not only at my age but in a completely different gender is I mean this has been a, another journey in alone of itself so <laughs> but I will say I will say that there have been many men who have reached out to me and complimented me for who I am who I am now and that that makes me feel good and, and be able to own who I am becoming, who I'm still becoming, even in the dating scene, as you know, I'm looking to, you know, find that special person in my life. Were there any hurdles or learning curves that you had to adapt to in your transition that we haven't covered yet so far? Dating was a hurdle. Speaking of hurdles, that that was a hurdle for me because you know, I was a heterosexual male. I was attracted to women. And when I transitioned over the course of my transition, I began being attracted to men. And that was a whole new thing for me. It was scary. It's like, how do I navigate this, right, in a safe yeah. way? And and I've learned how to do that. And I'm, I'm very grateful to be uh, to 
now being you know a year or so on that side of that hurdle having experienced you know both negative but positive experience experiences in my dating uh, journey has has been life-giving for me yeah that's <laughs> It's so funny. We talk about loving ourselves and all of that and how important that is. And that's the most important. But it, it's it's funny that even even far along in your journey that that external validation is still is, it still does so much. It, it really does. It really does. Can we kind of talk about that? I, I love that point. It's not something we get to talk about very often. Are there any like top level key points that you have for dating as a dating heterosexual men as a transgender woman to keep yourself safe? Oh my goodness. Great question. I actually did a Facebook post on this maybe a month, two months ago because, I mean, this is the reality of many trans women and maybe perhaps trans men who are uh, attracted to the opposite gender, right? Mm -hmm. And what I've learned over what I've learned over time is that, you know, while trans people are becoming more visible as time goes on, people who are attracted to trans people are less visible. So it's almost like they're lagging behind the the trans movement, if you will. So they've had to they've had to learn how to navigate their own journeys. And and what I've come to understand is that in their own journey they are imposed, whether it's self-imposed or imposed by a culture that says, what are you thinking? They are, they are in self-imposed or imposed with shame and guilt. You know, why, why am I attracted to this person? And so they're having to deal with their own journeys with this, right? Mm -hmm. So I've had to learn to, to be open and to be patient with men as they perhaps may be traveling, you know, their own journeys with, with me. And yeah. I've had men reach out to me saying, okay. I've never been with a trans woman, but I'm so attracted to you and I don't understand why, right? So they have to grapple with that in their own way. That's their own journey of authenticity when it comes to dating. Hmm. But there's a couple of things that I've learned. And that is, you know, if you if a guy immediately goes to the question of asking me, what is your, what are your, uh, anatomical parts what are your bio biological parts I immediately say well first of all you don't even know me and you're asking me that question uh, I feel like you know y y you are you are uh, misunderstanding who I am yeah. by asking me that question you get to know mm -hmm. me and then we'll have that conversation and then if they persist that's a swipe left for me yeah right another thing yeah. is another thing is is if you're not being if you're not being willing to see, be seen with me in public, I'm sorry. You know you have to you have to be okay with that because I am not going to live my life in a vacuum in a box, in the shadows, just because someone that I want to be with is not comfortable doing that. I yeah. will help you and embrace you along yeah. the way as you learn how to do that, but you got to commit to me that you're willing to do that, right? Because I had the courage to step out into this world as my authentic self. It's just, you have to do the same thing. Otherwise, this relationship is not going to work. Yeah. And then the last thing I'll let you know is that if you're not willing to introduce me to your friends and family, same thing. You know, I I will be the first to say, come join me at a, a gathering with my friends. Uh, and if you if you're not able to reciprocate that. Then I don't feel like you're all in with me, and I have to I have to know that you're all in with me. And when you make that commitment, then that's a step in the in the right direction. Yeah, and it's funny. I would ask you as a follow up question: Is that taxing for you in yet another aspect of your life to sort of take on an educational role where you you have to like help and aid the your potential partners in kind of getting through some of those things and answering some of those questions for themselves but considering your the advocacy and all of the other things that you do i would assume that that isn't the case well it depends on which what day you ask me okay if Fair it's enough. a good day if it's, if it's a good day i will lean in and i will support 
if it's a bad day, I might have a shorter attention span on that, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. but, I, but I will say that when I first started this journey with dating, around dating, I was, I was less patient. But now I, I think I consider myself a little bit more patient because I understand the dynamics that are at play here. And I, and I want to, I, I'm always this type of person that really wants to give the other person the benefit that, that they're doing the best that they can do with what they know, with what they have to work with. So, Thank you know, you. I'm willing to be patient with them to a degree, <laughs> but at some point in time, I have to have some kind of signal that you're willing to work with me as well. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you've worked out some what some of those key things are like so when are we going to hang out with your friends <laughs> that, that sort of a thing will be your, your early indicator exactly. <laughs> right are there ways in which transitioning has lived up to or fallen short of expectations that you had oh my goodness transition has surpassed my expectations i mean yeah there have been difficult moments there have been dark moments there have been moments when I didn't want to get out of bed, okay? I mean, if we, if we say anything less than that, I, I think that we're doing a disservice to those who are looking to travel their own journey of authenticity uh, around their own transition. But I will tell you, to your point earlier, you know, those, those risks, those costs uh, that I had to navigate through, those dark periods that I had to navigate through have only made my life richer and stronger and more confident and hopefully someone who can inspire and be an invitation to someone else that is considering you know what does this look like for me moving forward so i can tell you that i, I there's been dark moments but I, I i like to focus on the benefits of authenticity as opposed to the the cost of authenticity. What advice now in this part of your journey do you have for young or closeted trans people out there? A lot of us, I think, feel stuck where we where we currently are, and while we want to move forward and and have an, a, a goal of who we want to become, but we don't know the path. We don't know how to get there. And what I would encourage those who find themselves in this place is that to get unstuck, all you have to do is to take those small, courageous steps. You don't have to, uh, uh, what, is it, what is the phrase? You don't have to conquer Rome overnight. You know, this is a journey, it's not a sprint. It's a, it's, 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 it's a duration, it's a journey of duration. And you don't have to have a map. You don't have to understand what the next step is. You just need to take a step. I feel like a lot of times when we get stagnant mm -hmm. and we feel like that we can't move because we don't know what it's going to mean down the road, then we're giving, we're doing a disservice to ourselves. It's almost like the, the universe, God is inviting us saying, take that step. When you take that step, then you'll learn what the next step is. Yeah. So. Not, not, not placing so much pressure on you to have the plan in place before you take that first step. Take that first step. And when you take that first step, the second, the third, and the fourth step will make, make themselves uh, apparent to you. Gabrielle, thank you so much for your time. This has been wonderful. It's been really insightful to dive into your story and to hear not only about your past and what you went through to get to where you are, but where you have taken it since and what you're still doing. Yeah.